needed to connect to audio. Uh, to our series on how to engage in cyber policy for human rights defenders. Um, this series is um, really aimed at equipping you with connections about actors, issues, and forums. We hope to provide you with the foundational knowledge needed to um, enable you to engage in cyber policy debates and start shaping the discussion to be human rights respecting by design. Um, a key focus of this uh, series has been the relationship between cybersecurity and human rights. Um, this is really because uh, cybersecurity has become a catchphrase in a whole range of discussions dealing with different aspects of cyber policy, often pitting security against human rights. So getting the knowledge and resources needed to engage in these debates can be challenging, you know, and actually getting, the seat, getting a seat at the table. All these debates will differ from country to country. We hope these videos uh, your name sessions will provide a starting point for human rights defenders all over the world to kickstart on some policies um, in their own countries, really globally, um, and uh, support and promote uh, human rights and security in a balanced manner. Uh, so this online series is open to all. Uh, it will feed into the in-person training component of the overall cyber policy capacity building training program, um, and it's focused cyber policy making processes around the world more inclusive by building capacity and advocacy skills, fostering stronger collaboration and developing these rights respecting policies. So this webinar in particular, um, uh, this Q&A session, is a chance to gain clarity on the concepts, issues and frameworks introduced in the cybersecurity module videos and starting point, a solid starting point for engagement in what is really relatively a new field to ensure that human rights Considerations are not undermined in policy efforts to strengthen cyber security. Um, appreciating that many of the can need to be addressed, uh, this QA session hopes to provide you with the opportunity to ask any questions you may have about cybersecurity to want to work towards um, actively engaging in these debates. Um, so, you know, I have um, uh, a fair few people have um, sent in questions. Thank you very much. You know, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, I have a hashtag um, for, for the Q&A session. It's hashtag CyberTalk. So um, if you if you wish to tweet um, while, while you're on the session, please do um, share, share these widely. Um, we want as many people involved as possible. Um, all right, well, uh, with that, um, I'm going to hand it over to Nicholas Castellon of the CGI Group, um, who was the uh, uh, my lead for this uh, this uh, this um, Nicholas, um, please please go ahead. Hi team. So as I was, as you said, I'm a, a cybersecurity specialist at SEGI Group, um, a major systems integrator, and I'm an innovation fellow at the Lab of Land University. I, I specialize in cybersecurity governance. And critical infrastructure and data protection. Uh, also, on the board of the GPD Cybersecurity uh, Capacity Building Program and one of the co-authors. Uh, I'd like to introduce you guys to the, the discussions. Uh, or maybe it would be a good reminder uh, to the participants to please mute your microphone uh, because I hear a little wind in the background. If you guys just click on uh, the icon to mute your microphones. That will improve in the recording of this uh, webinar. Uh, first of all, Tatiana Tropina. Tatiana is a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute for Foreign Affairs and International Criminal Law. In this capacity, she is involved in legal research and applies cybersecurity and related projects at the international level. Uh, her areas of expertise include international legal standards and cybersecurity for making uh, investigations, self and co regulation, public private uh, security issues, and the multi stakeholder approaches to security. Uh, she's also active in the field of internet governance. And I think that Jan is also in the advisory board of the GPT capacity program. I'd like to introduce Matthew, uh, Matthew Ears. Uh, Matthew currently co chairs the Freedom Online Coalition Working Group on Rights and uh, Cybersecurity and is involved in the internet transition and enhancing ICANN's accountability. Uh, his engagement in internet governance has involved uh, the work of on the Infrared Society since 2005, the on international telecommunications, and the Brazil Net Mundial meeting. And the International Governance Forum, and 
was a member of the first multi-stakeholder advisory group. A little bit into the subject of cybersecurity. Um, you guys have probably seen uh, both videos of both definitions. And so we'll, we'll try to give it briefly right now. So security is a bit of a growing phenomenon. It's not exactly new, of course. And security can be traced back to the 1980s. And the case that it is growing is relatively new. And that's why security is thrown around quite extensively. It's, it's been turned into a buzzword that almost needs to be fulfilled when talking about technology. Sometimes the terms, of course, intertwined. And one of the things, of course, that right now we have 6 billion devices, uh, estimates by uh, some institutions. 2020 will be upwards of 20 billion devices. So that means more devices, more interconnectivity, and then this is what we have a room to discuss. Are we secure? Are we less secure? Regardless, we would like to, of course, use this, the definition we presented in the, in the video of cybersecurity, which security is the preservation through policy, technology, and education of the ability, quality, and integrity of information and its underlying infrastructure. So that enhance the security of persons, both online and offline. As you learn in the videos, there are more than 400 definitions, so we're just going to use this one as a main point. And, and of course, there are many definitions, and they all depend on the actor framing the topic. That's very important to keep into, uh, keep into account. And then in regards to threats, there are many threats, of course, in this space, but they should be scrutinized uh, are used to curtail our freedom. This is a Q&A, uh, so without any further delay, I would like to begin answering your questions. And thank you for seeing your questions. We're going to start off with, uh, with the first question. So what is cybersecurity? Uh, the whole webinar session on just that question, right? Um, uh, the Matthew or Tatiana, do you have any comments uh, in addition to what I just said about the definition of cybersecurity? Nicholas, uh, sorry. Matt, Go ahead, Uh, I can speak now, but maybe for the future, uh, Nicholas, you can just say who is speaking because we're very oh. polite and waiting for each other. Um, <laughs> okay, so no, I'm sorry about think, that. I, yeah, I think what is very important about the definition of cybersecurity, cybersecurity which you presented, is that it focuses on the humans. It is a user centered definition of cybersecurity. That's why we have to follow this definition because it's uh, designed and developed to focus on human rights and focus on, on persons instead of security of machines and systems. Thanks. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think we just take a step back because um, it's important to put, I think, um, a lot of this in a, a slightly broader context when we're talking about definitions. Amy? pitch in there just a reminder to everyone please do mute your when you're not speaking i'll get those echoes that'd be great thanks you're okay Aditi? yeah so i think it's important one of the things that i think is important is kind of to look at this um holistically and uh, as, as nicholas mentioned i'm the one of the co of the freedom online coalition working group one on an internet free and secure and one of the things that we have looked at over the period of time of the working group is really how to um, actually ensure or help bring about the, the importance of and really the importance of human rights when it comes to cyber policy and cyber framework development. And about as a result of the number of increasing comments in various cybersecurity related instruments or cybersecurity policies that talk about the importance of human rights, but often do so in a um, okay, somewhat of a passing fashion. In other words, it's not dealt with in any great detail or any great substance. These have been made in places like um, 
uh, GCCS or the uh, GGE of the United Nations. So, and we've seen them as a part of the, the Seoul uh, framework that came out of the London process. So, there's a growing awareness of the need to realize, to actually act on the human rights to be a part of cybersecurity. But there's very little, or very few mechanisms or tools to do that. So, what the group did was it set up these calls for human rights to be integrated. And this can do that and how we can move that forward. And one of the key things in that regard was actually to look at conditions of cybersecurity. And to a degree, human rights was a component of those definitions. And as you saw from the video, um, few references to human rights or the importance of individual security uh, in many of these definitions. And it's a, a kind of a different approach to um, the definition of cybersecurity by saying that we recognize that systems and information security are really important, but fundamental to that is individual security. And that's part of the definition. And that's a good um, hook, if you will, particularly and human rights advocates, to really that definition and say, okay, we understand from a policymaker perspective that, that you are concerned about system security. But there is a dimension that is equally important, and this approach, this definition, has also worked on some recommendations that we see that um, activists and advocates can take forward. Thanks. Thank you for that, Matthew. Next question. Uh, question is, how to collaborate the human rights definition on cybersecurity since there's a salient gap in defining such a concept in policy, such a gap is too extreme that the collaboration has never happened in policy making. The answer kind of comes back to what I said just now, which is there is a recognition of the importance of human rights. Um, and we see also a growing recognition of the importance of privacy. I think the 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 what we're now as advocates is to say, okay, we we recognise that you've made this commitment on paper or, or otherwise to recognising the importance of cyber security, uh, privacy, and human rights. But what are the sort of concrete steps that are going to be taken to address this? And then um, we've done in the working group is to uh, outline a set of recommendations that you can activists can present to government and say, this is. On the work that you've committed to, let's take this forward as uh, as partners in a kind of in a multi-stakeholder approach. So I think the the now is the time where uh, with some openings, some door, some some uh, slight openings, and and there's an opportunity there for for human rights and advocates to to get involved more from the rights privacy angle. So I think um, it is, um, but there are opportunities, and we're seeing that increasingly with Various in different governments in different countries, where governments are actually reaching out to stakeholders and involving them more. Not enough, but certainly more. Thanks, Jenna. Would you? Add to what Matt said, I think we are thinking about definition. We also have to think about processes. If there's a gap between definitions and there's no way to reach out to the government. Let's think about processes. Let's think about making it step by step. What do we do today and tomorrow to change this? Maybe change this definition like there would be no simple solution. There is there would be no river ballot or anything like this. But you make it step by step by raising awareness, by trying to reach different other holders like businesses, other civil society groups, and even governments as well, but movements. Maybe at one point you will just meet in the middle. So don't think only about definition if you cannot change current situation right now and reach out to the government. Think of steps in, in a way like how you can chunk this job into pieces and just walk in step by step somewhere. And the situation will be different in different countries on the national level. I believe that in some countries it would be dangerous to raise your voice at this stage. Some governments would be much 
more open. And as Matthew already said, there is growing awareness. And more opens even, even like this, even a bit, you can put your foot there and hold it. Thanks. Um, it's useful to to know what you can leverage, um, and one of the things that um, that we're finding is is particularly useful is finding text and commitments as I said earlier on that have been made. So, for example, one such commitment came out of the global community in the Hague, in which it shares this final statement, which is really the summary document of that, and one that governments take away and look to for guidance. The chair basically, and I'll quote directly, said that to ensure that cybersecurity policies are for exception rights respecting and consistent with international law and international human rights instruments. Words there um, can be leveraged in not only in, in the GCCS but in the spaces as well that can be leveraged to as a door opener. Um, and that's a key thing to, to look to because there is absolutely no doubt that when working with policymakers, um, going to existing commitments and existing language, whether they be national, regional, or international level, is a very good way of, um, of getting, of opening that door. Thanks. Uh, speaking, I would also like to jump whether, for example, if you are from the Commonwealth country, there are some guiding principles from Commonwealth Telecommunication Organization, for example. There are principles on cyber, cyber governance and there are principles on cybersecurity strategy, the state. I mean, of course, in many, in many things, in many senses, they are more declarative now, but still, uh, you can take them. You can say Commonwealth Telecommunication Strategy is saying that human rights should be respected. Commonwealth uh, cyber, governance, cyber governance principles say that has to be involved. Just start with the small pieces and just move forward because it will eventually open. Or at least I want to believe it. Thanks. Uh, the Indonesian government uh, has never been clear in defining that concept in regulation. Is it regulated as an unclear Is it regulated in law on purpose? Would you like to take that? Well, um, the question about purpose is quite subjective. I think that there are so many stakeholders involved in the cybersecurity governance, so that the, the definition of purpose is, is kind of strange, you know, because there could be like security services. I, I have to be honest, I'm not aware about particular situation in, in, in Indonesia. But let's say I, I, I don't believe there is one single person who is responsible for this and who defines this person. Of course, there is a kind of direction. Of course, the, the absence of definition, the absence of human rights focus is a kind of murky question and, and it's, it's all shadows and, and smokes and mirrors. And it is, it is hard to say why it is happening and apparently it is very good for government when it's not defined. But if we think about what to do no, I do think that the absence of definition is actually a window of opportunity. Because when you have a definition, precise definition, which is against human rights, or to securitize, it is to change the current state of things. When there is no definition, there is basically tabula rasa space where you jump by, by shaping the agenda. And when the definition is being shaped on you or anyone else, businesses, any other stakeholders, can to force the government to shape the definition, it might at the end include some commitment to human rights or at least user-centric approach. I know that maybe I sound overly optimistic, but that the absence of the definition is not such a bad issue because you still have a chance to shape it, be it in Indonesia or anywhere else. Um, and in a way, it points to uh, the challenge that um, advocates have. It's not only in a, a definitional purpose sense, but it's also in knowing where the focus 
of focus should be with the different ministries or different agencies. And it's difficult to understand whether or not something sits within the Ministry of Communications or the Ministry of Defense, um, what the priorities are and which, which at the end of the day is the one that one should be engaging with. I think this is something that is a, a very legitimate step, is a very legitimate issue to raise with governments and say it's to understand what the policy approach is when we have this very vague sense of purpose, but also we'd like to understand better what is the frame for that and also where will that discussion on which agency should we be engaging with and focus. And I think those are very good can bring to policymakers uh, also as a way of starting a, a discussion and saying we want to be involved, but we need a little bit of clarity, a little bit of sense of where your thinking is in terms of addressing cybersecurity issues. Thank you for that, man. Uh, can I do something? Would you like to add? All right, what are the next question then? And then reads, uh, why the focus on cybersecurity as we talk about cyber policy? Very good question. Um, I think one of the challenges in this space is that we have a, uh, not only do we have um, 400 different types of definitions of cybersecurity, but we also have perhaps a not a particularly common sense of what is cybersecurity, nor what are its component parts. Uh, there are, you know, typically one could look at things like information security. You can look at cyber as another part of cybersecurity or cyber conflicts. So I think one of the, again, one of the, these are one of the challenges when trying to um, take a focused approach to cybersecurity is that we're still very much in a kind of a um, space, um, very, very difficult to do so. Um, uh, I think that if we are, to, it's it's a very re relevant question. Thank you for this. I think the cyber policy is just an overarching of the whole series. And if you want to know more about cyber policy that would be particular video for example on regulatory frameworks which is not concentrated on cyber security I, I know because I, I was one of the drafters of the script I think this particular thing is about cyber threats as a component of cyber policy but it brings me to, to, to a broader issue for if you google cyber policy the first top results will talk about both the cyber policy or internet governance or city policy for that matter. You see that in many countries, like I think in Australia or in some others, cyber policy divisions or cyber policy departments are actually cyber security departments. And I do agree that there is a big confusion. And I do agree that we have to focus on the broader range of cyber policy issues, which this video series will definitely do in cyber security just being on particular day on cyber threat. I think that we really need to think about definitions and we really need to think that what we call cyber policy actually used to be ICT policy, which came from the definition of telecom regulation. And everything is being merged and overlapping and it's hard to, to, to draw the lines because the lines are blurring. But, but not least, it is security which is, which is pressing issue for human rights defenders because most cyber policies are actually enabling per se, for example, diversity, for inclusion, and many others. Cyber security where human rights are getting oppressed. It is security which is used by government as a tool to intervene in many areas of private life of a person. And, and would be focused on cybersecurity for this reason, because it's a tool to use, and this is the most important issue for you as well. Thanks. Um, just go back to the definition that was presented in the, the, in the video. Um, think about, if you can 
bring cybersecurity into what it is and what what the goal of it is. I mean, the way that we looked at that within the working group was that the goal of cybersecurity is really to enhance the security of persons offline and online. How do you do that? Well, you do the policy, technology, education, um, so there's a whole range of, of things that can be done to bring that about. So I think really the, the, in, when cybersecurity, you can, in a way, approach policymakers with a that encompasses all those broad approaches. And maybe it is, for example, with technologists and saying, we can address cybersecurity from this particular angle, looking at technology and human rights. And so there's a diversity of ways to address cybersecurity, and there's a diversity of ways to address some of the challenges. Again, um, to to mad said, but just you know to turn it upside down. You think about cyber policy, any cyber policy, so and essentially about internet information and communication networks, about enabling a bust, but we trust cyberspace without making it safe and secure for humans. And basically, if we, if we are talking about human rights-centric approaches to cyber policy, to internet as a tool of, for, for development and for prosperity, humans, what issue in this? How do we supply internet, for example, for some communities or to kind of person? How can we empower them, for example, if they're under the threat of crime and fraud? We trust our data to um, um, provide there's no privacy. So, so interconnected. So security is an essential part of cyber policy. And basically any cyber policy will mean security and trust anyway. And not in terms of uh, of information that works, but about security of people who are using this internet. I'll jump to the very good session. Thank you. We're going to go to the next session on um, the difference in cybersecurity, which could be found in the cyber threats video. And uh, reads uh, the definition of cybersecurity related to cyber threats are framed uh, key elements and why. Uh, Tatiana, would you like to pick that up? If you mean the definition of cybersecurity, which we are using. Here and cyber threats. Okay, let's split this question into two. It's about technical security of networks, about cyber threats or crime. It is about integrity and availability and confidentiality of systems and infrastructures. It's about other threats, which are not actually threats like, for example, then of using the Internet for some purposes. It's spread to um, rights. So you, you saw the differences in different of cyber threats. So if we are thinking about technical threats, it would be security and availability of systems and networks, but also a broader question of human rights and trust of users in the system. Things. Raises a, a, another good question, which I'm, I'm sure we'll probably come back to as well, which is um, the importance of having a common understanding of the point of departure and talking to influencers and policymakers. And say it's uh, different stakeholders and different actors come to cybersecurity with very different perspectives. And the things that we tried to take into account when we were developing this definition was how do you bring the, the, the human rights dimension into the definition, as well as still ensure that you're covering off the key issues that Tatiana just re, uh, just referenced. I think that uh, that coming to an understanding of commonplace in terms of understanding what policymakers and what other stakeholders are through cybersecurity is one of the kind of first steps that can be undertaken through sitting down with policymakers and saying, okay, what exactly do you mean? Here's what. We and understanding how to take that discussion forward. For that, Matthew. Uh, jump to the next question right now. Uh, which is, what are the security challenges states have? What are the challenges human rights defenders face? And I guess 
this okay, so that would be um, there's a, a nexus. I'm sure there's a clever way of graphing this out or doing it visually, but there's a nexus between the challenges and uh, the states face and the challenges that human rights defenders face in the cybersecurity space. Um, in the way, there is which actions uh, that are taken against a state impact upon the populace, um, and there's actions that the state can take in response that can have consequences for the uh, availability of the network, for um, encryption um, and privacy. And so, you know, in many ways, there's a, there's a kind of a matrix, if you will, where the um, key uh, state, do in fact, result in a threat to defenders. And it's finding a common point, um, and rights defenders can respond. Respond, how they should respond in proportionate ways uh, is is a key kind of point of discussion and um, a space in which human rights can take that discussion forward. And so, uh, it's it's not always so. States may face technological threats; they may face threats to critical infrastructure, um, but these are systems, and it's important to emphasize that threats to critical infrastructure can knock out, which obviously significant consequences for advocates, but generally for the for the population. So I think that there would always be a human dimension, which is um, human dimension tends to make the discussion about cybersecurity more difficult. It's about it in technical terms. Um, I'm going to jump to subject uh, cyber crime. Sorry. Uh, oh, sorry. Can, I, I'm, can I do now? Oh, yes, because course, I sorry. believe that what Matthew was talking about, he was talking about responsible democratic states. But one of the challenges of states who are not that responsible democratic are facing are actually a threat to regime itself. And to be honest, and that's where uh, there is no way to meet in the middle with human rights defenders. This is just a remark, thanks. No, I, I just meant that if we are talking about critical information infrastructure protection, if we are talking about the, the challenges states state to, to, for example, protect citizens from crime, to investigate crimes, to, to the, the hard choice for any state right now, responsible and democratic state, is the choice, for example, between regulating uh, critical information infrastructure and collaborating with the critical information infrastructure provider. And, and I, I can go with this on and on and on. And, and as Matt, right, you uh, rightly said, that um, this can be changed to human centric and there could be middle ground which can be formed between human rights defenders and, and states, but that's talking about responsible states and democratic states. But if we are talking about undemocratic regimes, we're talking about regimes whose sole duty to protect regime itself from any um, um, of information against regime on the internet, and these states do consider this as a cybersecurity threat. Of the challenges of this, because that is in a way uncontrollable, which are by the state, would be completely different. And this is oppressive laws are being passed. This is technical measures are being implemented. And in the life of human rights defenders in this country would be completely different. In addition to all this changing agenda, you know, from Technical approach to cybersecurity to human rights and approach to cybersecurity, which we are talking about, uh, the, the way to this change would be much longer in a way. It would be many more steps, you know, because you have to circumvent so many um, measures and because you have to um, do many things via grassroots movements, via 
campaigns, you know, via city building. And it would be different than just changing the agenda of the state. So I don't know if it's correct we can be here, but let's say that there are states and states. And if we are talking about state, let's define what state is. Is it the government? Is it regime? Or is it just, you know, some virtual like any state? Depending on the definition and depending on realities in a particular state, the challenges would be different for both for the state and for human rights defenders. Um, yeah, it's more to say there, and there is more to say. But of course, we have 90 minutes for this, and I'll move into the next question, um, which is how does Securitized narratives surrounding the internet affect how threats are viewed, and then add to that viewed or perceived. It starts to be defined as perception. Uh, how cybercrime laws are used to widely address very different threats, and that's on that question. Um, yeah, so I think that. to what I was talking about before, it depends on threats, on the next level, how governments are viewing them, the crime law, and the way of framing the threats, and cybersecurity laws, and the way of addressing these threats would be different. For example, two examples from the video, about human rights defenders and other like, just civil society activists being investigated investigated under cybercrime laws for insulting the president of one particular country. So the security agenda will be different depending on this, how these cyber threats are framed. And many, many regimes, in my, for example, home country, I'm, I'm Russian, I live in Germany, but I'm Russian. In many ways, these cyber threats are framed as content threats. In many ways, they are framed in many countries, first of all, in two content threats. Governments are passing the laws which will protect children, from, protect citizens from extremist speech, protect governments from the extremist speech, and then they are perceiving some external threats. For example, information war coming from, let's say, countries, narratives, and the laws would be tightened because uh, these kind of governments are between the devil and between the deep blue sea, you know, between external threats of changing regime and internal threats of doing something against regimes. Uh, this definition of cyber security threats will go so wide and will be concentrated on really information infrastructure protection. The narrative will go completely into the regulation of content and into the investigation of these internal threats to regime. So in political context, I think, on framing the issue. There may be some states which are transitioning, which cannot actually choose their cybersecurity agenda, and where human rights defenders can be so active to show it, because women still don't know what to do and how to do it. But if we are coming to some countries, it's really a hard job, and it's much harder job than just shaping the agenda from the very beginning. Tatiana covered that very well, but just to add, I think this this is a this is the that this community is facing at the moment is how the narrative is being increasingly shaped by securitization, crime, and the range of um, concerns that legit or otherwise that are being brought under this umbrella, and it's very difficult to um, to address where. I think that we, the community, the human rights advocates community, all should kind of think a little bit about is what, to what degree is it possible to work with others to bring that narrative? Many times, coming at that narrative from solely from a human rights perspective um, will not necessarily have the same response as if you come from it from a technical and human rights or from a business 
justice and human rights perspective. And I think of multiple ways of approaching this narrative. And this narrative is not just, uh, unfortunately, it's a very prevalent narrative. Um, and talking space, this is a um, probably dominant narrative at the moment. And in many ways, it's going to take a lot of work of stakeholders to change that narrative, but it's certainly one that we, we really do need to undertake. Jonathan, I really want to thank Matthew for this intervention. I felt like in the past five or ten minutes that I'm only talking, but not really all solutions. But I believe that if we are talking about only human rights defenders, in many countries it would, it would be very hard, if not impossible, to change the situation. But if you are like are much more approachable in many cases. Technical community is much more approachable than governments. And you can always use this dialogue. You can start building this dialogue first and see what can be done. If you want a civil society, try to approach businesses. Try to like-minded people there. Not every business are caring about money. There are many, many businesses owned or supported by global service providers who care about reputation as well. Think about this. Try to approach them, especially the technical community. They are more open. Thanks. Well, a uh, section on cybercrime. It's often argued for greater security due to the expanded jurisdiction of cybercrime across borders. Laws and penal codes are not enough to prosecute cyber criminals overseas. How do we online freedom given that the internet is borderless? And the Budapest Convention play crime. Tatiana, you can pick that up, please. Question. It is a great question. I I I will um it into several pieces. Any crime legislation means two things. First, crime is what is important or hacking into system or line fraud or something like this. This is part of any cyber crime law and part of any cyber crime law in the nation frameworks. So it committed the crime. How government can investigate me? Do they go to the court, my, my data, or police intercept my communication, for example, with no warrants? In both cases, human rights can be oppressed. Let's say human rights violation might happen. First of all, if we are talking about crimes, um, how is given? We need that consent is not a crime. There should be a kind of proper body child pornography would be probably but is targeting or criticizing a president it's a crime. And this this shall be one of the main narratives. What when we say the content is a crime. And how do we deal with this content if this is a crime? We need by a a court order, or do we call some hotline and, and content gets removed? Who is this decision? Judiciary, judiciary involved. Another big issue because even in many countries in Europe, content is taken down just a one phone call, and this is this situation is unacceptable because it exactly endangers online freedom because no one is actually making any proper checks. So um, let me draw this here what crime is. So use this what crime is question to oppress freedom of speech, making particular type of content crime and taking it down without any court orders. The second question is a very tough question of crimes. Because whether you like it or not, police and governments has to have to investigate real crime as well. How online many things to ensure maybe not freedom, but at least let's say privacy or freedom of encryption 
or freedom to communicate, or like freedom what we are doing with our data. There's proper frameworks. Like, for example, if someone wants to intercept my communication, they do it via court warrant, not the choice. The question is intrusiveness of many instruments, like what, which instruments they use to intercept communication. I just accept it on, on, on the provider side, or if I encrypt them, I'm able to hide my computer and install a special software which will capture this communication. So the use of the tools, first of all, how is involved, who enabling the use of these tools. And of course, is convention. They do play a big role there. I mean, if you think about the Biodiverse Convention, there is Article 15, safeguards and human rights. So the uh, safeguards are in place. But of course, say which safeguards because it's a Council of Europe Convention and Council of Europe has um, human rights documents and, and European Court on, Court on Human Rights. It is, it is a different thing. But what Council of Europe is doing, as far as I am concerned, they do go to foreign countries who are not party of Council of, 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 of Council of Europe itself, who are not members, but who are parties of this convention, and they do capacity building, and upon request, they do help to draft legislation, and upon request, they do want to ensure that rights are in place. But basically, what international, any international frameworks are doing, uh, country in country A, and a request from country B, communication for some weird crime which doesn't exist in my country, I will just simply not do this. In this way, international law is blocking unnecessary requests, let's say. So it's also a function of, of, of criminal law. But it's a big work, so it's not only crime per se, or not only investigation, but it's just, as, as we started, it is these human rights-centric approaches by default that we have to debate and ensure that, that there is no framework be cyber security that it is dra that is drafted without taking into account human rights safeguards. Thanks. Well, um, the problem of those this um, cross jurisdictional challenges in security is probably one of the biggest challenges that we as a community because it's it's one of the deficiencies that we're seeing um, increasing is the rapidity with which governments can respond or agencies can respond to requests for information from other countries and the degree to which that information can be shared and how long it takes to actually go through the various steps to actually share that information. And I think this is something that governments, agencies and stakeholders are doing with the stakeholders things of business particularly. And I think this is something that's going to be an increasing challenge because from the perspective of, of um, two approaches, one of which is to cooperate, to seek information, to exchange information with other parties. And it is, is to lock down, is to shut down as much as you can to prevent that kind of, um, of attack or that kind of threat from other countries. Um, and what we need to be doing as a, as a community, and, and it kind of comes back to the question that was raised earlier on, which is how to work across stakeholders to really shift the debate on that as well, because what we want to see is cooperation on with certain conditions, but to cooperate rather than just um, taking what often is kind of a knee-jerk reaction, which is to run a network or, or do some way um, and impinge upon human rights. Thank you for that. Would you like to add? No, thanks. All right. The next question. Which, what are the implications of attempt to ban the use of end-to-end -end encryption or any sort of encryption? Yes, absolutely. Well, let's just imagine that you are in the key from home under the doma. This is it, this basically describes it all. These are the implications. One, 
the back door or a button, like I say, when we are buying encryption. There is no way to communicate security. Any communication can be accessed, not only by users, but also by businesses, by governments. So basically, it's, it's, it's a big drawback for the whole economy and the whole security of the society. If you're talking about backdoor to encryption, once you handle this encrypted key, it's, it's like your own house. Because you must use such sophisticated techniques and to use infiltration into law enforcement agencies many things to get these keys. It's handled, it's not safe. And this basically, I mean, we can go on and on with debate about banning encryption or providing the back door to encryption, but basically be summed up in, 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 in a one, one nice way. The key under the DOMA in both cases, in, in case of the ban on encryption and in case of, of, of providing back doors. Thanks. Um, that's yeah, absolutely right. Um, the, the the problem we have here, and I, and I think in some degree this comes down to a technical and education issue as well, uh, is the, the perception that any any communication that is in some way not accessible is suspect. Uh, the moment one is using a VPN, one becomes suspect. The moment one is using uh, suspect. In many ways, the, the, uh, this again is one of those situations where it's important to understand and important to educate as to why we're using encryption, why it's important, why it's important to privacy, and it's necessarily a threat. Um, and why, for example, it's also incredibly important to business. Um, uh, there are dimensions to this that can and need to be um, further delved into stakeholders in terms of the value and importance of encryption. And again, it's often one of those immediate responses that come from policymakers, which is, well, well this is what's going on, therefore we have to ban it. And I think that really is um, an unfortunate point of departure and something where education and understanding technology is, is a key to kind of moving that forward constructively. Thank you. Uh, I'll jump into the next question. By law enforcement, with the capability to still ensure the system is accurate as and encryption is adopted with doors and alternative sources of information or data. Law enforcement could be looking into to investigate crimes while doing encryption. Matthew, um, I'm an encryption specialist, so um, there. Are, and of course, there has been this this on put it let's say it's a discussion in the United States between Apple and the FBI, um, and I kind of illustrate of the challenges that we face in this space. Um, it, it, there is, um, this kind of dovetails nicely with the last, with the last discussion. I think there are, um, time, again, it comes to the issue of proportionality, right? There are times when it may be necessary to act devices, but that may be specific conditions um, with a very specific cause. Um, again, of, of what kind of a, Proposals or requests as to the um, particular case that may be under investigation or whatever. Uh, it's practical, feasible to say that we don't need to the devices, but I don't, I don't think it's either does one want perpetual uh, you know, backdoor to these devices. A, a very challenging in between space, but it does get down to um, what is appropriate and what is an appropriate response to the situation at hand. Yes, this is exactly the topic, one of my primary topics. So enforcement use, because every and cases, especially when law enforcement are dealing with uh, 
um, it's not only crime, uh, law enforcement, which type of crime they're dealing with when they're dealing with secure communications and end-to-end -end encryption, it would be mostly uh, human trafficking uh, and drug trafficking. So they're able only to access metadata and use many techniques how to trace someone using only this metadata without even accessing the content of communication. But this is not enough. What is in there? There is such a thing which is called remote forensic software. If you are thinking about it like Apple FBI, it's just, you know, accessing has information. Uh, the most important problem for law enforcement is not actually accessing stored information. Uh, the most important problem is using this provision of interception so when people are communicating right now in transmission and in many cases like WhatsApp or Viber will never use this information and technically it would be impossible. There is such a thing called remote forensic software. In some cases it is allowed, like let's say look at France, look at Spain, look at the United Kingdom, this new bill or investigatory powers is trying to, to use this provision to actually UK police, I believe, used it already under two different laws, just combining provision. Is it a dangerous technique? Yes, it is a dangerous technique because it means that someone's computer or phone is hacked, so software is installed, which comes information. In a way, it's like breaking into house of criminal and installing surveillance of like cameras or bugs in the walls. So, I mean, but, but it's much more seamless and much more intrusive. So, the safeguards. The safety. Install this software, there should be a particular type of dangerous crime, like, for example, no less, no less than seven years of imprisonment. What's dangerous of this technique? If this software can be hacked as well. There was a story about German software Bundestroyan, which was used to um, spy criminals and uh, which just went, you know, all around uncontrollably or at least it was discovered that it could well, it could capture information which was not supposed to be captured from people who were not supposed to be the subject of this surveillance. But the, the short answer is yes, there are techniques which allow to collect information without providing vector encryption. There are many social engineering techniques because if you think that criminals are very smart no, I'm sorry, they are stupid. They do leave traces. They do sometimes feel so, you know, out of any legal context that they start even giving their personal email addresses somewhere, and this can be traced. And of course, infiltration to different networks, of course, different social engineering techniques look by law enforcement agencies. If you go to law enforcement with all this, they shout at me and tell me that this is not enough, we need more tools. But what said there is no more tools. Thanks. Thank you, Um We'll jump to the question. Uh, in combat cybercrime and terrorism, governments need data, and this data uh, from mass surveillance. As human rights defenders concerned with preserving the right to privacy, how do we combat this? And maybe you would like to pick this one up. Tatiana? As a lawyer, I would again like to make the distinction. There are only two types of laws, which, which will, only type of laws, which will allow mass surveillance. First, it's crime. So when crime is committed and you have to investigate crime, there, was, um, there, would be, there would be surveillance, but there would be no mass surveillance because crime will always be investigation of one particular uh, case. So let's put it aside. So let's think that for, for investigation frameworks, we have to have some safeguards in place in criminal law. Then we come to two other issues. In many countries, there is prevent police law, where for the purpose of crime prevention, you can collect information on users in the absence of suspicion or, you know, in kind of slight suspicion or something like this. We need to ensure that proper safeguards are not only in criminal law. We need to ensure that preventive police law involve, uh, involves judiciary or some other kind of checks and balances for data collection. Um, 
many of you, the question would be why are we having this law in place in the first place? Why do we have to have them? Well, if you analyze all democratic or undemocratic regimes, this law, these laws do exist. They do exist traditionally, and there is a need for these laws to prevent crime and to prevent dangerous crime. The only thing is how the data is collected. It's Responsible collection of the data, other checks and balances. And now the greatest area of all this it is intelligence law, when to national security. And in some in some countries there is there is still a need for judicial authorization of this survey. And this, this is what we have to 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 echo, you know, to any any to judicially approve to have balances. In a way, there would be laws like these, but make them uncontrollable. I believe that if it's legislated anyway, we have to think about proper safeguards, and we have to think about enablers, and we have to think about responsible handling of all this, of all this information collection, so about the balance. Because balance, there should be no balance. There should be responsibility and accountability from the very beginning. Thanks. Dan has covered it very well, but um, I think the key word there is seems um, mass surveillance. I think that um, there are uh, situations when some data that's absolutely essential to cybercrime and terrorism and extremism doesn't come from mass surveillance. It comes from um, what you might call more traditional policing, um, working within communities and other approaches. So I think that it's very um, that governments understand that mass surveillance is not the kind of panacea. Um, there are some of the other techniques that have been used successfully in the past and more target precise techniques actually can and provide much uh, useful results. And I think that's a very important note when discussing things like mass surveillance to continue to push. Thanks. I would like to jump to the one very concrete example. I was I was in Brussels uh, in, in January and people discussed mass surveillance. And one of the governmental representatives, or, or let's say intelligence, agency representative in Brussels stood up and told, you know what, we are collecting so much data. I'm not sure we need this data because we don't know what to do with this data. We don't have effective techniques to, do, to, to deal with this amount of data. I'm not sure we need more laws for collecting this data. I'm not sure we need more enablers for collecting this data. And guess what? Yes, it was all about information from abroad. It was it was it was about not proper community policy and social environment and after that we had two terrorist attacks in Brussels. So it's all very clear there is absolutely no link between mass surveillance and data and actually targeted responses. Thanks Matthew. I am building up on what you said. The VPN or TOR, so the Onion Router, Human Rights Defenders in Cyberspace, implications of using such platforms in human rights campaigns. Jana, would you like to pick this one up? The, the answer is yes. Yes, VPN or TOR, especially if you are a threat, it's, it's not in good. It, it's Essential. So circumventing surveillance techniques are essential. What are the implications? I don't think anyone will blame human rights defenders for this because, believe it or not, uh, police is using VPN and secure communication. Police and TOR for communications, law enforcement agencies are using them, as well as um, intelligence agencies. Businesses are using VPN, so it is normal. And the implications of this, of course, Secure communications. It is of course awareness that these platforms can be used. So I would encourage anyone to use it unless, unless it is and you are under threat while using it. 
then of course it is it is a big ethical question and a big question of how one has to uh, break on human laws. So I will not incite anyone to do so. Thank you. Well, and what I will add, though, is that um, um, occasionally, um, as I mentioned, I referred to this before, um, the are tools, as Tatiana said, that uh, many are using it. Yes, it is. Um, but those using these tools are using it for the wrong reasons uh, to undermine the state or to commit cybercrime or whatever. Um, and I think it's, it's really important that, that the policymakers understand that these tools are essential to advocacy and activists. Um, and it's not a situation where uh, I was maybe it was a head of the Homeland Security or something in the United States who said that once you use a VPN, you're a suspect. Um, that is a, a, an absolutely the wrong kind of way of looking at these tools. And I think there's a, an element of education that needs to go on in terms of understanding the importance importance of privacy and anonymity and rules in different um, spaces where it's necessary. And so I think, again, a, a discussion that's ongoing, I'm not sure we're going to see um, any comments respond to these tools, but certainly they're invaluable. Jumping the next one. Uh, are there cases where a government has passed a cybercrime law that recognizes human rights? Matthew, would you like to answer? I want to answer. Um, I think having this discussion and why we've done a lot of work in the working group I'm a part of is because we realize that, that uh, not in achieved and not enough recognition of the importance of human rights and we're still working with a different kind of framing in terms of cyber security. We're still looking at a, a systems framing rather than a, a post-security framing. Um, this is a, a, a challenge that we have to deal with. Now, being made, there's absolutely no doubt that there are more, more on cyber security policies that are open to stakeholders to, to participate. Uh, and to contribute to. Uh, there are more um, in which stakeholders in civil society are starting to make inroads in um, some of the uh, um, are involving multi-stakeholder um, committees. Some uh, governments are reaching out to stakeholders more broadly in the first stage of policy or law drafting. Um, so it's difficult Point to one in particular. Perhaps Tatiana can point to one, but the, certainly there is. We'll be encouraged by the openness, but we still have a considerable amount of work to do. We bring about kind of framing that we really actually need to see in policies going forward. Um, Tatiana, would you like to add something? Well, because my answer would be yes. Yes, there are some examples. Talking only about cybercrime laws, it's been about substantive laws, what cybercrime is. Many countries could be, you know, on the forefront of this, like the Netherlands, like Germany, like many democratic countries. More important, so we investigate the crimes and make the example of the ones. The data collection, for example, for the purpose of crime. I take some time, but it is, a, it is a very interesting issue which has exact direct relation to human rights. Right now, communication takes only one second when I'm sending an email to someone. In countries, interception of communication can be applicable only to communication and transition. When I'm sending the email from my computer to someone else, then it gets stored. And Rules on the access to stored information, which 
circumvent this interception provision, which only has like judicial approval and whatever. In many countries, access to stored communication doesn't. And law enforcement in many countries, in terms of human rights and safeguards, who is enabling? Or shall we, while, while this person sends this email, then we will not need any court warrant. So, for example, it's everything that requires court warrant. Be it interception, it's all equal. We are protecting everybody because privacy and human rights in this regard are very important. I think that I'm getting this discussion to such a specific issue, but I know that the question said cybercrime. So there are very good examples where governments have been considered in how we are investigating crimes and what do we make like being a crime. But of course, of course, there is much more to do, as many of you said. I think, I think what, what also, what this points up is a very interesting issue, which, which is um, we, from the human space, and you start to look at the kind of multi-stakeholder space um, a little bit more broadly, um, the issues that have been made in terms of being able to influence policy are significant. It's to get into these more sensitive spaces that we take more challenges, and I think that you know to some degree that's perfectly understandable. Um, when cyber conflict or cyber attacks, that tends to be seen as the purview of the state. Um, I think that as Tatiana, there are examples to point to, which is incredibly useful from a legacy and point of view. Um, but also, it's important to to think about how without necessarily approaching them head on, the other ways. And I think that this what we've talked a little about in the in the process of this discussion is how to working with other stakeholders to bring about a result that more than just a from one stakeholder perspective alone. And I think what we've seen in the multi stakeholder space and I suspect if more of it's taken in the cybercrime space we might see more um better sense as well. Question concerns multi stakeholders and stakeholders in cyberspace. So, the question is what is the role of the different stakeholders in securing cyberspace? Governments, private sector, civil society, tech communities, etc. And where does the responsibility of the private sector begin and where does it end? And the of that question. It's, it's interesting the way it's been framed because um, it's framed much along the kind of traditional notion of there being these 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 bodies, government, business, civil society, academia, and the technical community. Actually, it's it's significantly more complex, but then it's in the greater complexity, it offers more opportunity as well. Um, when you think about the stakeholders from a holistic perspective, who are who should be concerned about and have an interest in the general issue of cybercrime, we're actually talking about much more diverse set of players. Um, in a diverse set of players, you really have to look at what well, impacted. Um, but it's not just government. If you start to break that down, you're actually looking at the and the press are being impacted. Uh, the legal profession is being impacted. The range of other players that may have a very useful role in partnering with to raise the issue of human rights more broadly and to talk about what the impact of cybercrime is on the that, that broader that, that broad kind of view of what of who the stakeholders are, and some of those are particularly influential. Um, the legal community is particularly influential in terms of bringing about policy change, and the risk of cybercrime can disproportionately affect that community as well as the media community. So, when you're thinking about stakeholders, it's important to think not just in the context of the kind of way that we think about multi-stakeholderism. Um, Policy spaces. Um, every has a set of responsibilities. Those are evolving, and I, I you know, I, a lot of people think back to the the West definitions and responsibilities, and I said that we we have to get out of that trap. Um, it has as much of a useful role at the table as business when it comes to cybersecurity, and particularly when it comes to talking about things like privacy and trust and human rights. And so 
um, we, we need to be really careful we don't get sucked into that kind of uh, over a decade old way of looking at um, roles and responsibilities. There is a doubt that when it comes to cybersecurity, we have, have this human rights advocates community has a big in getting to the table. Our governments have recognized that there's a, a degree of importance of having business at the table. They've recognized as a uh, having technologists at the table. Obviously, they should be there. And those views should be but is that civil society should be at the table, and particularly human rights advocates. This is, you know, it's, again, it's how do you other stakeholders know where roles and responsibilities begin and end in them with non governmental stakeholders? There's a common interest. Unfortunate responses to cyber attacks can impact every non-governmental stakeholder. And I think it's that point of canality where one can, can start from. Thank you. Question from other participants. Uh, in some African countries, we have had asking mobile operators to put on social media platforms. To discourage governments from such attempts in the future, and Matt, could you briefly cover this? Yeah, you know, it comes back to something we've been talking about before, which is disproportionate responses, and and this kind of listening in a way that social media um, is only about fomenting challenges to the state or to government. But social media is used in so many different ways now. There's a, a, a you know, there is there are small and businesses that are dependent upon social media. There are some agencies that are dependent upon social media in, in some cases. So I think there's a, it's very, it's all too easy to say, again, this is about the, the, the kind of, I think that's the right way of putting it, jerk reaction, which is to just shut off the network and we'll, we'll, we'll deal with all these issues. Um, there are cases and there are, there's data out there in terms of the cost of network shutdowns. Um, and that are in different countries. And I think those are pretty compelling numbers to be able to use with policymakers who may be com contemplating such approaches. And also, the fact that the more that you squash and down such networks and make them inaccessible, the more that the possible demand on them. So it's in a very counterproductive and counterintuitive type of approach to deal with a problem which may be very limited. So I think it's, it's this issue of proportional response again, which is important. But certainly, network shutdowns are not, no way to address any of these issues. Thanks. Thank you. Um, first, I'm working for the private sector. I would just like to mention, highlight on something you have mentioned about the roles of the stakeholders evolving. I'd like to turn this field of cybersecurity, of course, because now the private sector. Which are we talking about critical infrastructure? The private sector actually owns almost all critical infrastructure. The private sector has a new role, which is to secure and protect, which is a role that is quite unique for the private sector. It has only been found after the 60s and 70s. One of the uh, good points that I just heard was that there is um, there, there is a very good friend to find in the private sector, because private sector and civil society, of course, are bound by the same rules as a civil society. In a certain way, uh, we have um, different points. But we're bound by the same uh, regulation. I uh, just wanted to stress on that, that. Of course, speaking with the private sector might actually be a very good uh, civil society organization. And of course, we're running a bit out of time, so I'm going to jump to the next question. Uh, it's to, uh, rights. Uh, should governments go in ensuring the security of its citizens? Give measures typically encroach on individual privacy rights. Are the demonstrate how both security and human rights can coexist? Um, great one because it, it gets to the heart of of and and also to the heart of the work that that we've been doing in the in the working group, which is really to find out that balance. Um, not in terms of balancing privacy against security, but but understanding the, the the roles and responsibilities of the different stakeholders in this space and how 
we can find commonality of purpose. Um, it's easy for governments to respond disproportionately, as we said, um, and it's to be um, a common use to be found between stakeholders to work on these issues. And to all we don't have that. We have a point of departure that tends to be overly antagonistic. Um, and I think the, the only forward on increase, increasingly um, diverse issues, cybercrime and cyber conflict, really to say, okay, let's let's down, let's let's start with a blank page. How are we going to address this and how are we going to to involve stakeholders, and I and I I think, um, of course, this will define and, and and issue, but the, that taking a very um, constructive approach around a challenging issue may well be a door opening type of approach. Um, these are very difficult issues to address. If policymakers don't have the expertise at the table and can't find a way forward, they will say what to approaches that um, may have the kind of result that they're anticipating. I have nothing to add to that. It was well articulated. Okay. Challenges does the Internet of Things pose our security and privacy is concerned. And of course, Internet of Things is one of, another one of those buzzwords that is being thrown around to just basically say that things are becoming interconnected. So toaster now has a chip, your fridge now has a chip, your car, your watch, your glass, your everything, your shoes, etc. So Matt, would you like this one? I think this is one of those areas. So there are a couple of areas where I think we actually have, have an opportunity as a community. There are a couple of areas that, that are new that in which the, uh, the reframing has not yet really been determined, in which the degree of opportunity and the degrees of threat have not yet been determined. Uh, these are areas such as Internet of Things, um, decision-making, in other words, algorithms, um, for example, and then the broader issue of, of, of artificial intelligence. And I think all of these areas are still in formative stages in terms of policy making and formative stages in terms of understanding what the various implications of them are for society and for economy. So I think um, this is a great space and a great time to say looking at um, the, the potential challenges, the potential op and the opportunities from a holistic perspective. Um, you're talking about digital algorithms and data analysis. Um, these elements them actually raise a whole host of, of uh, ethical and moral dilemmas that can be addressed in some way or other. So, for example, if you're using a particular algorithm, how impact or uh, person the particular inequalities in society? How does that impact upon a uh, person's or a community's ability to lift out of poverty? So there are several dimensions and issues that go just beyond the kind of the traditional human rights framing that actually I think are, are right for by activists and, and, and activists in the in a slightly broader sense than just human rights activists. It's activists who have to really take into account um, the broader issues of society, broader issues of poverty, broad, broad issues of inequality, and understanding how those dimensions will need to be addressed in those policy spaces in the future. So I think this is one of those spaces that has not evolved efficiently yet, and therefore there's an opportunity for, for this community. Thanks. This is, this is an amazing window of opportunity to jump for human rights activists, especially finding a space where you can communicate with other activists, technical community and businesses. And why 
is it for me so not only like what math told from issues and ethical issues for me as for a lawyer from legal perspective it it requires probably a complete reconsideration of the concept of privacy what privacy is when it's not only humans communicating to humans when there would be pure machine to machine communication who is actually accountable for decisions taken by them what is the privacy consent model informed consent model and how it is going to exist in this new context what are behavioral and habits data collection and of course like awareness in terms of security many more devices much more open to attacks for protection, password harvesting, so if we are talking about security cases. But all in all, since we developed, there is a good opportunity to jump and to find yourself. And if the, the concept of privacy would be reconsidered, if the concept of security would be reconsidered, there is a very good chance to make it human rights oriented by design. Thank you for that, Tatiana. We're going to go on to our final question. Also, a very good segue into the final question. Uh, how can human rights defenders get a foot in the door when generally decisions are made behind closed doors with security actors? And do you have any case studies that make spaces for advocacy? Tatiana. Question for which I believe we don't have precise answer. Maybe Matthew has. But I believe that we covered some of these steps during the, 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 this webinar, during this Q&A session, where you can leverage your expertise, how you can take decisions that are being made behind closed doors sometimes or on the international level and, and, and take some pieces of this decision and say, look, like for example, Global Conference for Cyberspace agreed that human rights should be a part of this. Or look, Commonwealth Cybersecurity Strategy and Cyber Governance principles are saying this but of course in some countries it wouldn't be easy and if you are asking me about real case studies well the doors are getting opened like for example I, I you won't google a uh, hip car project uh, the project led by EU and ITU which developed uh, cyber policy frameworks for Caribbean countries and this is where some of the doors opened I believe like for example Trinidad and Tobago are that also implemented um, openly that policies, for example, shall be made in multi-stakeholder manner with the participation of civil society. So, you know, it's, it's not like there could be one silver bullet, one, one size fits all solution. There are many processes on the international level, sometimes on the national level. Just try to follow first. Try to see where the window of opportunity is. Because it is very hard to speak in general because for one country it would be much easier because doors are opening but for some countries where teams are oppressive and it's perceived to be a blogger and human rights activist in this country the techniques would be absolutely and completely different so just try to learn from other experience try to cooperate with different communities try to approach your government via businesses try to collaborate with other stakeholders if your government is not approachable Thanks. Matthew, would you like a couple of points to that because this is this is a very very real challenge, um, and particularly in this space versus some other spaces, the real um, opportunity um, sometimes is not the obvious one. Saving this point for for some concluding comments, but I'll say it now. Sometimes we can achieve what we want by not actually taking the obvious human rights approach. Sometimes we're here to, more importantly, we're here to talk about economics, we're here to talk about societal change, we're here to talk about empowerment, and we're here to talk about economy and the importance that these things, and of course, of rights has to economy. So the door be closed from one particular angle, but it's about talking to other stakeholders, about talking to other influencers, and about thinking about what's what benefits, what 
to this if they open the door to us. And because maybe perhaps sometimes looking at the point of opening that door that will then allow a more fuller and freer discussion about human rights. I would like to add to that as well that uh, it's about framing the issue, of course, as you were saying, uh, what is the language of the private sector and what is the language of uh, the civil society, of course, uh, only has to gain by understanding uh, how to enter these conversations by speaking the language, as you said, uh, cybersecurity can be approached from these many different perspectives. So, for example, in the case of the Netherlands, the Netherlands sees cybersecurity uh, through a foreign affairs perspective, defense perspective, uh, security and justice perspective, and through an economic affairs perspective. Uh, so it's very and, sorry in, in international relations perspective. So when you're in conversations, be able to understand how to leverage your point and it's nice, but be able to reflect it in a way that they'll be able to absorb it in their discussion. And I think we can go into uh, to the wrap up right now. And um, there are two takeaways. I'll, I'll start by saying that well, the webinar and with the two videos um, that we before, uh, you could probably the way that well, civil society should uh, approach the topic of cybersecurity with healthy skepticism and understand uh, the definition and of the roles of the different actors and vantage points of private and public organizations. This civil society should be more effectively engaged in these policy discussions at forums, uh, open calls, and such. Or actually, Matthew, would you like to this uh, use or <laughs> yeah. yeah, thanks, Nicholas. So just a couple of kind of takeaways in terms of uh, getting into these spaces. Um, so, uh, um, not and bring them to the table. Um, and, and that's a part of the, the importance of this of this series is understanding um, the typical basis for cyber attacks, understanding the consequences of those attacks. In other words, building the knowledge that's necessary to engage in those discussions is critical. Um, kind of you know, kind of inferred throughout this 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 session, um, think about you with other stakeholders. To our doors and also talk together towards um, policy goals because plenty of spaces, and particularly in the cyberspace, where goals may well be the same. So I think stakeholder approaches, um, as we in the working group, look to commitments that have been made by, by the regions in which they, they, they cooperate with other countries and, and at the international level, and where can those be leveraged in your discussions? for best practice. Uh, um, Tatia referred to a number of different um, policy frameworks that, that have those, that have leadership in those spaces. And, um, as I just really think about the broader context of what's, what we're trying to achieve, we're trying to achieve a greater rights, but the broader picture of that is, is what is really is the empowerment of the populace, of peoples, it's about bringing about economic and social change. It's about it's about increasing trust in the government, in the in the in the IT framing that the government and the populace works within. So I think there are these are kind of of waking about breaking, which granted is not always easy, but I think about there's the the, the the zombie here, and I think there are some good pointers to to taking that discussion forward. Thanks. Tatiana, including remarks, maybe some takeaways? Oh, you guys really say it very well, but I would like to add some practical things to Matt's point on being cooperative and on being non-conventional. Think which other forms you can access business and technical community. With my mind, for example, is ICANN, is IDF. If you, if you have any technical guys, try to achieve some collaboration by IETF. So start with a broader perspective. Yes, don't con concentrate now on human rights only and think about yourself like only as opposition to the government 
or to regime or to strategies or to anything. Think about collaboration. Think how you can actually enhance this collaboration, how you can foster this, and how you can leverage your knowledge and everything. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Tatiana, thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, thank you, all of you, for attending. Uh, this was, uh, I hope uh, inform all of you. And with, we will end the webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Thank you. Next time, to tune in for the regulatory framework. Uh, webinar and um, those videos are now um, live on the on the YouTube channel. So please please do have a look. Um, for great contributors in the world, Tatiana is one of them, and we have Maciel as well. Um, so please have a look. Um, and it was a great discussion today. Thank you for all your questions. Um, best to sort of make sure there has been an even spread of the different topics. If your uh, questions weren't answered this time. Um, or there are so many more opportunities coming up. Um, there's a regulatory frameworks webinar, there's capacity building, there's um, also the regional webinars where we can ask more um, tailored questions to local context, um, more broader, a broader thematic questions. So uh, do keep uh, sending those questions in and um, I look forward to more discussions on them. Thanks everyone for joining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.